piece, short for something longer than that, <laughs> from the August 16th edition of Blown Tweeter magazine. Now, Blown Tweeter magazine has enjoyed my enthusiastic support ever since they shifted their editorial focus to the socio-political, interpersonal, and secular theological underpinnings of the music business and away from publishing nothing but photos of budgerigars engaging in fellatio. <clears throat> but beyond their top-notch investigative reportage that won the Roxanne Pulitzer Prize three years running, and their justly revered review section which eschewed outmoded rating systems involving stars or letter grades in favor of a revolutionary format utilizing the numbers 1 through 100. <laughs> Their think pieces remain among the thinkiest in journalism. <laughs> and over the years, I have contributed a number of these exploratory gems to their op-ed section, that number being one. <laughs> <laughs> and here is an excerpt from that is entitled State of the Industry, One Critic's Perspective. <clears throat> Though no few of my colleagues have expended no dearth of breath defending the rights of music fans engaged in the acts of downloading and file sharing, I have made it abundantly clear that, on this issue, I must separate myself from the pack. This was not quite as daunting a task as one might believe, seeing as I had already alienated myself from the vast majority for daring to question the innate value of such critics' gar darlings as Das Uberated and Fresh Wardrobe for the Emperor, <laughs> and also for stabbing Robert Christgau in the chest with an umbrella at his 60th birthday party. Oops. The free procuring of copyrighted materials by anyone other than respected arts commentators <laughs> who require a steady stream of said product to feed their brilliance is purely and simply an unlawful, illegal crime. But not only do I lay the blame at the ill-shod feet of the bepimpled miscreants, wantonly looting in 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 intellectual <laughs> property, <laughs> I also fervently maintain that the recording industry itself is slowly strangling itself with the piano wire of cowardly half-measures, which in itself will prove sufficient to kill itself if the industry itself does not look itself to strike itself at the soft spot just above the base of the problem itself. <laughs> the lawsuits, fines, and house raids inflicted upon those caught purloining the fruits of the record company's hard work are an encouraging start. But it's obvious that the RIAA has not gone nearly far enough. To that end, I have been devoting the lion's share of my free time performing citizens' arrests, Provide, presiding, I should say, over citizens' tribunals and incarcerating individuals in citizens' jails, viz. the old dog cages in my attic, <laughs> for the crime of getting songs stuck in their head without proper remuneration. <laughs> Already, one individual has been sentenced to four years of hard labor for walking around his office whistling the song more than a feeling. <laughs> this too is a decisive step in the right direction, but it will not reach fruition and bear the fruits of said fruition until those reading these words follow my example and vigilantly police birthday parties, karaoke bars, and residential shower stalls to ensure that no copyright infringement crimes are being committed. I strongly urge all civil legislators, industry executives, and busybodies nationwide to ensure that this comes to pass. Thank you. <clears throat> ah, you're too correct, thank you. <clears throat> I am now going to read two pieces, my two final pieces this evening. I know, please, don't weep. <laughs> These are pieces inspired by one of our greatest national tragedies, the <laughs> death of J.F.K. <clears throat> John Fitzgerald 
Kennedy. One of our 44 greatest presidents. <laughs> this was such a momentous occasion for all of us that I think justice could only be done by my writing twice about it. First, I will begin with my personal reminiscence. A tale that in many ways is the story of us all. Although, I will slap anyone who repeats it with a class action lawsuit. <laughs> This is Memories of an American Trauma Remembered from the National Recollectionator, November 2003. I remember it as clearly as if it were four decades ago this month. <laughs> I was sitting, as I was wont to do, in my classroom, staring abstractedly at my teacher, Miss Lorgnette, whose Botticellian beauty <laughs> From certain angles, she looked exactly like the great Renaissance painter. <laughs> <laughs> Had begun to arouse the nascent colossus in my short pants. <laughs> and caused me perforce to choke on my paste. <laughs> How sad it was, months later, when I changed my major to Hegelian philosophy and bass technique and was forced to drop her course. But. November the 22nd, 1963, was destined to be no ordinary day. It was the day my own personal path was diverted along the detour that led down the unfamiliar dirt roads connecting to the off-ramp just over the county line of my, and by extension America's, future. <laughs> Something in the air. Perhaps it was the combination of romantic longing and something unpleasant coming from the remedial smelting lab down the hall <laughs> had seized me that day. I was moved in a new unfamiliar way by the movements of a crinoline moo moo and <laughs> driven by a compulsion I can only describe as the state of being compelled. <coughs> I flung open my red chief notepad, took up my burnt sienna quill, and composed my first poem. <clears throat> oh, Miss Lorgnette, you are like Venus, only with arms <laughs> and a lower overall surface temperature. <laughs> oh, the things I could do to you with this protractor. <laughs> Note to future anthologists, the rights to this poem are held by me in perpetuity. Do not reprint without proper compensation. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> in that moment, the course of my life had been decided. This day, November the 22nd, 1963, I knew would be remembered to generations as yet unborn as the day McChesney Dunce became a writer. So lost was I in my reverie that I scarcely noticed the weeping figure of the Dean in front of us, not swept up in the birth of an avocation as I suspected he was, but bearing news which upstaged me somewhat. <laughs> I have terrible news, he said. The president has been assassinated. Most were horrified by this news, but I, with my newborn perception, recognized it for what it was. Not so much the end of an era, but the beginning of another. Perhaps both. <laughs> we would be deeply scarred as a nation, no question. But I knew, just as I am sitting in front of my computer wearing only a tube top today, <laughs> that soon, perhaps only months from that moment, our scars would be salved by the arrival of a cultural firestorm from overseas, born by knowing innocents who, quite inadvertently, were destined to change the landscape in ways that would continue to resonate for decades to come. The following year, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas arrived in America, <laughs> and my prophecy was borne out. <laughs> Thank you. One final piece now. 